the words of a poet, that the poor man comes to the feast of nature and finds no cover laid for him, and adds that she bids him be gone, for he did not before his birth ask of society, whether or not he is welcome. This is now the pet theory of all genuine English bourgeois, and very naturally, since it is the most specious excuse for them, and has, moreover, a good deal of truth in it under existing conditions. If, then, the problem is not to make the surplus population useful, to transform it into available population, but merely to let it starve to death in the least objectionable way and to prevent its having too many children, this, of course, is simple enough, provided the surplus population perceives its own superfluousness and takes kindly to starvation. There is, however, in spite of the violent exertions of the humane bourgeoisie, no immediate prospect of its succeeding, in bringing about such a disposition among the workers. The workers have taken it into their heads that they, with their busy hands, are the necessary, and the rich capitalists, who do nothing, the surplus population. Since, however, the rich hold all the power, the proletarians must submit, if they will not good-temperedly perceive it for themselves, to have the law actually declare them superfluous. This has been done by the new poor law. The old poor law which rested upon the Act of 1601 the 43rd of Elizabeth, naively started from the notion, that it is the duty of the parish, to provide for the maintenance of the poor. Whoever had no work received relief, and the poor man regarded the parish as pledged to protect him from starvation. He demanded his weekly relief as his right, not as a favour, and this became, at last, too much for the bourgeoisie. In 1833, when the bourgeoisie had just come into power through the reform bill, and pauperism in the country districts had just reached its full development, the bourgeoisie began the reform of the poor law according to its own point of view. A commission was appointed, which investigated the administration of the poor laws, and revealed a multitude of abuses. It was discovered that the whole working class in the country was pauperized, and more or less dependent upon the rates from which they received relief when wages were low. It was found that this system by which the unemployed were maintained, the ill-paid and the parents of large families relieved, fathers of illegitimate children required to pay alimony, and poverty, in general, recognized as needing protection. It was found that this system was ruining the nation, was a check upon industry, a reward for improvident marriage, a stimulus to increased population, and a means of counterbalancing the effect of an increased population upon wages, a national provision for discouraging the honest and industrious, and protecting the lazy, vicious, and improvident, calculated to destroy the bonds of family life, hinder systematically the accumulation of capital, scatter that which is already accumulated, and ruin the taxpayers. Moreover, in the provision of aliment, it sets a premium upon illegitimate children. Words of the report of the Poor Law Commissioners 286 This description of the action of the old poor law is certainly correct. Relief fosters laziness and increase of surplus population. Under present social conditions it is perfectly clear that the poor man is compelled to be an egotist, and when he can choose, living equally well in either case, he prefers doing nothing to working. But what follows therefrom? That our present social conditions are good for nothing, and not as the Malthusian commissioners conclude, that poverty is a crime, and, as such, to be visited with heinous penalties which may serve as a warning to others. But these wise Malthusians were so thoroughly convinced of the infallibility of their theory, that they did not for one moment hesitate to cast the poor into the procrasty and better their economic notions and treat them with the most revolting cruelty. Convinced with Malthus and the rest of the adherents of free competition, that it is best to let each one take care of himself, they would have preferred to abolish the poor laws altogether. Since, however, they had neither the courage nor the authority to do this, they proposed a poor law constructed as far as possible in harmony with the doctrine of Malthus, which is yet more barbarous than that of Laissez Faire, because it interferes actively in cases in which the latter is passive. We have seen how Malthus characterizes poverty, or rather the want of employment, as a crime under the title superfluity, and recommends for it punishment by starvation. The commissioners were not quite so barbarous, death outright by starvation was something too terrible even for a poor law commissioner. Good, said they, we grant you poor a right to exist, but only to exist, the right to multiply you have not, nor the right to exist as befits human beings. 
you're a pest, and if we cannot get rid of you as we do of other pests, you shall feel, at least, that you're a pest, and you shall at least be held in check, kept from bringing into the world other surplus, either directly or through inducing another's laziness and want of employment. Live you shall, but live as an awful warning to all those who might have inducements to become superfluous. They accordingly brought in the new poor law, which was passed by Parliament in 1834, and continues in force down to the present day. All relief and money and provisions was abolished, the only relief allowed, was admission to the workhouses immediately built. The regulations for these workhouses, or, as the people call them, poor law bestills, is such as to frighten away everyone who has the slightest prospect of life without this form of public charity. To make sure, the true relief be applied for only in the most extreme cases, and after every other effort had failed, the workhouse has been made the most repulsive residence which the refined ingenuity of a malfusion can invent. The food is worse than that of the most ill-paid working man while employed, and the work harder, or they might prefer the workhouse to their wretched existence outside. Meat, especially fresh meat, is rarely furnished, chiefly potatoes, the worst possible bread and oatmeal porridge, little or no beer. The food of criminal prisoners is better, as a rule, so that the paupers frequently commit some offence for the purpose of getting into jail. For the workhouse is a jail too, he who does not finish his task gets nothing to eat, he who wishes to go out must ask permission, which is granted or not, according to his behaviour or the inspector's whim. Tobacco is forbidden, also the receipt of gifts from relatives or friends outside the house. The paupers wear a workhouse uniform, and are handed over, helpless and without redress, to the caprice of the inspectors. To prevent their labour from competing with that of outside concerns, they are set to rather useless tasks the men break stones, as much as a strong man can accomplish with effort in a day, the women, children, and aged men pick oakum, for I know not what insignificant use. To prevent the superfluous from multiplying, and demoralize parents from influencing their children, families are broken up, the husband is placed in one wing, the wife in another, the children in a third, and they are permitted to see one another only at stated times after long intervals, and then only when they have, in the opinion of the officials, behaved well. And in order to shut off the external world from contamination by pauperism within these bastilles, the inmates are permitted to receive visits only with the consent of the officials, and in the reception rooms, to communicate in general with the world outside only by leaving under supervision. Yet the food is supposed to be wholesome and the treatment humane with all this. But the intent of the law is too loudly outspoken for this requirement, to be in any wise fulfilled. The poll or commissioners and the whole English bourgeoisie deceive themselves, if they believe the administration of the law possible without these results. The treatment, which the letter of the law prescribes, is in direct contradiction of its spirit. If the law in its essence, proclaims the poor criminals, the workhouses prisons, their inmates beyond the pale of the law, beyond the pale of humanity, objects of disgust and repulsion, then all commands to the contrary are unavailing. In practice, the spirit and not the letter of the law is followed in the treatment of the poor, as in the following few examples. In the workhouse at Greenwich, in the summer of 1843, a boy five years old was punished by being shut into the dead room, where he had to sleep upon the lids of the coffins. In the workhouse at Hearn, the same punishment was inflicted upon a little girl for wetting the bed at night, and this method of punishment seems to be a favourite one. This workhouse, which stands in one of the most beautiful regions of Kent, is peculiar, in so far as its windows open only upon the court, and but two, newly introduced, afford the inmates a glimpse of the outer world. The author who relates this in the Illuminated magazine, closes his description with the words, If God punishes men for crimes as man punishes man for poverty, then woe to the sons of Adam. In November, 1843, a man died at Leicester, who had been dismissed two days before from the workhouse at Coventry. The details of the treatment of the poor in this institution are revolting. The man, George Robson, had a wound upon the shoulder, the treatment of which was wholly neglected. He was set to work at the pump, using the sound arm, was given only the usual workhouse fare, which he was utterly unable to digest by reason of the unhealed wound and his general debility. He naturally grew weaker, and the more he complained, the more brutally he was treated. When his wife tried to bring him her drop of beer, she was reprimanded, and forced to drink it herself in the presence of the female warder. He became ill, but received no better treatment. 
Finally, at his own request, and under the most insulting epithets, he was discharged, accompanied by his wife. Two days later he died at Leicester, in consequence of the neglected wound, and of the food given him, which was utterly indigestible for one in his condition, as the surgeon presented the inquest testified. When he was discharged, there were handed